So today, uh, uh, we're, we're going to talk about the global development agenda. I think uh, like most of you are graduate students in like, international studies. So you are familiar with the term Millennium Development Goals and Sustainable Development Goals. Am I right? Right? Okay, so when I ask a question to you or when you have any comment, please turn on your mic microphone in front of you, okay? Okay, so we will briefly uh, talk about the global de de development agenda today. So I'm just briefly going over the MDG and how MDG transformed to SDG. Then we will discuss about the viewpoint from eight proponents in international development. And also there is some skeptics. So we will see the each side of argument. And finally, we just, just take a look at the new trends for international development in the 21st century. Okay, so anyone knows what is the no MDG Millennium Development Goal number one? Okay. Okay, so when you uh, answer my question, please turn on your microphone. Uh, he answered <laughs> that uh, extreme poverty and hunger, right? So that's the MDG number one, extreme poverty and hunger, right? So in 2000, September, when UN General Assembly gathered in New York City, the head of state from 189 country, they just signed the UN Millennium Declaration. And they said that, oh, we're going to achieve these eight Millennium Development Goal by 2015. So that's the basic structure of MDG. And the first goal of MDG is to reduce the extreme poverty and hunger, right? Okay, so when we set the goal, we should have the baseline, isn't it? So what is our baseline? Our baseline is 1990. So compared to the level of extreme poverty in 1990, we would like to reduce the extreme poverty by half by the end of 2015. That's the MDG number one, right? Okay, then can you guess what the extreme poverty would mean? Anyone have an experience to see in your own eye the extreme poverty? How we can define extreme poverty? Okay, please turn on your mic, Pron. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, extreme poverty may be the people without any basic needs, foods, water, and um, clothes, um, and house. Yeah, people without extreme, without basic needs. That's, that's correct. Uh, if the people cannot meet the basic needs, we can say, oh, you are in extreme poor situation. Yes, but as you see that there are many ways to define poverty, isn't it, right? You can define poverty in like economic, economic manner, or you can see, oh, socially or some politically, there is a multi-dimension of poverty. So when we say extreme poverty, we're talking about more like the economic extreme poverty. So when we define extreme poverty, if people living under the less than one dollar per day, we used to say that, oh, this is extremely poor people. But uh, we realized that one dollar per day is too low. So they adjusted the extreme poverty line from one dollar per day to one dollar, 25 cents per day. That's the definition of extreme poverty. But also we realized that oh, still one dollar, 25 cents, it's too low to meet the basic needs of a human being. So the World Bank increased the definition, increased the bar of the extreme poverty up to $1.90 per day. But as you may notice, it's a bit difficult to pronounce, isn't it? It used to be very, like, very quick, like $1 per day, or extremely poor, right? And $2 per day, these are like poor people, right? But here now we have to say that $1.90 per day. So I think in a couple of years later, World Bank will again adjust the bar of extreme poverty up to, I think, $2 per day. It's easy to pronounce, right? So, um, so this is the MDG number one. And compared to the baseline in 1990, we reduced the extreme poverty by half and we achieved this first MDG. 
right? And more than 1.2 billion people free from extreme poverty, mainly driven by China and India. These two giant countries made a big success in their economic development. So billions of, pe billions of people, they just free from extreme poverty. But still, there are many, many people in extreme poverty, like mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan African country like, haven't been able to make this such great achievement like China and India. So we do have some heterogeneity by region. But like, on average, we achieved the first MDG. Uh, by the way, how can we measure hunger then? Anyone has an idea? Please, yeah, thank you. By the ingest of calories. Oh, intake calorie is a really good measure to, uh, for the hunger. So usually, when we have some survey, we ask, what did you eat yesterday? And we just calculate calorie intake. But there is a much easier way to ask this question. The basic question we ask is, how many meals did you have yesterday? So usually, expected answer is three meals, isn't it? But if the people are really poor, and they may say, oh, I had only two meals per day, or like one meal per day, right? So that's a, like a really good question to measure hunger. And we also ask this another similar question that, did you feel hunger? before you go to bed yesterday. Anyone feel hunger uh, yesterday? <laughs> oh, <you. laughs> so the yesterday dinner was not enough, right? So we also ask those kind of questions. But in detail, uh, as your colleague mentioned, we also ask, what did you eat yesterday? Uh, I, I eat maize three times, how many grams? And I eat like egg and I eat vegetables and we, ca we calculate the calorie intake. So here, the extreme poverty and hunger are the main and number one target. And second one is universal primary education. That was our MDG number two. I guess most of you are graduate student, am I correct? Right? No? Undergraduate student and graduate student, right? So among you, the tertiary education is quite common, right? You are a bachelor, you are like undergraduate student, master's student, maybe some of you are thinking of like, applying for a PhD program later. But when all the head of states in the world gather together, let's talk about the global education issue. Our main challenge is let's send our children at least to primary education. That was the global reality, right? So here we achieved this MDG number two, universal primary education, like, like more than 90%. Right? But still, like, we have to meet the, the gap 10%, but 10% like, mean almost 5 million, 5.8 million children, they still out of like, primary school, the basic education. So that's a number two. Okay, anyone knows MDG number three? Gender equality. Gender equality. <laughs> I know. You already have the, my lecture slide, right? <laughs> I know. So, yes, that's a gender equality. But gender equality also has many dimensions, right? We may talk about gender equality within family. Also, we, we may talk about the gender equality within politics. For example, oh, when, we, when we select the members of parliament, at least 30% of the seat should be taken by a woman. Those kind of thing also, we say, all oh, gender equality in politics. It's a multi-dimension, right? But in Millennium Development Goal, we were very specific in gender equality. That's gender equality in education, right? So in MDG number two, we're talking about, let's send our children to primary school at least. That's our MDG number two. And MDG number three is when we send our boy to school, Let's send our guard to school as well. That's our MDG number three, right? So here, when we are sending one boy, one son to a school, and if we send 0.97 to 1.03 girls to school, then we say, oh, we achieve MDG number three. That's our target number three. And over the last 15 years, from 2000 to 2015, we pretty much achieved the MDG number three Gender equality in primary education, right? 
uh, but not in secondary education. Anyone guess why we failed to achieve gender equality in secondary education? Let's give an opportunity. So let's make a rule here. If KDI school student like have chance to say, the next turn is another three, another three like Hidochibasi or Lubung or the SNU students like equal opportunity. Any anyone any other? Please, yeah. Why do you think that we failed to achieve gender equality in secondary education? Oh, only marriage is one reason, yes. So when we just visit a school, the primary school in least developed country, for my case, Malawi, Ethiopia, like girls in a sixth grade, seventh grade, they dropped out. And I, I, I ask, why these girls drop out? And oh, they, she's got pregnant, she, she got married or something like that. So only marriage is like a one big reason, but it's not the main reason. Okay? They forced to work. They force work. Child labor is also the big, big barrier for the children's education, not only for boys, but also for girls. Could you? Yeah. Yes, Professor. Uh, the, when you, uh, in, the, in the MDG, uh, when you go for the gender equality, we uh, focus on enrollment rate, but we don't focus on the dropout rate. That is the main reason. Whenever the student goes from primary to the secondary education, in the case of the goal, there is a high dropout rate uh, due to the main reasons uh, shared by my friends, um, maybe the child labor and the early marriage. Uh, so it is a dropout rate. Uh, that is the main reason for the. Oh, that's an excellent like comment. Uh, which school do you come from? <laughs> KDI school? <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, I'm joking, right? Uh, he just pointed out very important point the limitation of MDG. We'll talk about it later in detail, but like think about it. When we think about secondary education, what is the basic assumption? The basic assumption is that boy or girl successfully finish the primary school. Then he or she can apply for a secondary school, right? If he or she fail to learn the basic education and learning in primary education dropout or then how she or he can apply for a secondary school, right? So that's a one reason, yes. Like the actual running is not taking place in the primary school. Many kids, the, we are talking about, oh, let's enroll the kids in a primary school. It's more like a quantity oriented goal, but there was a big limitation about whether the actual learning take, taking place. The quality side, it's a, bit, a little bit missing in MDG. But like, yet that's a very important reason. But still, I'm just looking for the main, main reason. Yes. Uh, primary education is usually free in most yes. countries, but secondary education has costs, a lot of costs. Exactly. So like money talks. Money here, primary school. Most of like developing country, even least developed country, they made primary school free for, free for everybody. So however, secondary school, you have to pay tuition and school fees and other related costs. Right, and in Malawi, uh, when I worked in Malawi in like 2011, 12, 13, 14, at that time, the secondary school annual fee, annual tuition was about like sixty dollars. Right, to, to some of you, sixty dollar is a little money, but like compared to the Malawi's like GDP per capita, the sixty dollar per year is a really big money. Right. Let's assume that you are very poor, your budget is constrained, and you have many boys and girls, right? And here, uh, you have to pay $60, let's say, out of your $1,000 per year. That's your annual salary, and you have to spend like $60 for the secondary school education. Then, are you going to send boys and girls equally to secondary school? What would be your best strategy then? It costs a lot of money, right? So then, let's say you have many boys and girls. What is your choice for secondary school? Eldest, regardless of gender, maybe. Maybe they prefer like eldest boy, who they think that very smart to go for a secondary school. So in those process, usually girls are neglected. 
right? Oh, you're going to get soon married. Why, why, why you try to afford a secondary school? I, I have to pay a lot of money. You get, you soon like, get married and right. so usually because of these economic reasons and many cultural reasons, they just like, we just fail to achieve the gender equality in secondary education, right? Okay, and number four, that's a child mortality. We wanna reduce the child mortality, that's MDG number four, right? And here the target is reduced the under five mortality by two thirds. And the, our baseline is 1990, right? So in 1990 back then, the, um, here, the, like almost like 10% of child, they die before they reach the age of five. So when we define the child mortality, our, we usually calculate the child mortality per 1,000 life births, right? So when we say here 9.9% child mortality means here when we have 1,000 live births, right? Then almost like 100, ba 100 babies, they just die before they reach the age of five, right? And we wanna reduce this child mortality by two thirds by the end of 2015. So our target was 40 out of 1,000, right? And as you see that we reduced the child mortality down to 5.3%, but still we failed to meet our target 4%, right? And so still more than like 6 million child, they just die and mainly like located in the Sub-Saharan Africa, okay? And let's think about what is the main cause for this child mortality? Anyone, uh, by the way, Anyone know, anyone have some sense of child mortality in like advanced country per 1,000 life births? Of course, we do have many different measures. When we measure the first seven day, like mortality, it's early mortality. For 28 days, it's uh, like a neonatal mortality. And when we say first one year, it's an infant mortality and on the five mortality, there are different measures, but roughly speaking here, Anyone knows in like South Korea per 1,000 life births? Maybe I think in the developed country, the uh, monetary, uh, child monetary mortality is uh, 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 0 0.3. 100. Yeah, like usually like three to four kids per 1,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now we used to have like 100, 100 out of 1,000. Then we reduced to like 53 per 1,000, but still we haven't met the MDG goal. And what is the number one reason I think you guess? Yes, please. More nutrition, amount, yeah. it's kind of like fundamental cause, isn't it? Yeah. Like 50% like of your health disease in a least developed country is attributed to the like more nutrition, right? But can we think about more direct like cause? Malaria. Malaria is also really killer to children, yes. Yes? Maybe like malnutrition, but lack of water, clean water. L lack of? Water. Water, uh. yes, water and sanitation is also yeah. very, very important. Uh, when the babies and children are drinking on safe water, it causes diarrhea. So diarrhea is kind of like a number one reason for this child mortality. Uh. And think about it, like, in order to treat diarrhea, you don't require a specialist, right? Simply, uh, you have rehydrating, I think that's enough. Like, a, the, like a, some like some fluid with salt. Mm -hmm. And however, very preventable and simple disease, like take away the value of the lives of children, like millions of children's lives. So diarrhea is one reason. Yes, fever and respiratory disease and malaria. They are so easy to prevent, so easy to treat, but those kind of like the diarrhea or the malaria, respiratory disease take away like millions of children's lives, right? Okay, and when we look at the child mortality, child mortality issue is much severe in poor household or uneducated family herd. So here, if a mothers are uneducated in those family, usually the child mortality rate is much higher than the other family where moms got education. So here, the, the, when you have the MDG or eight goals, they are all interconnected. So here, yes, 
Like if we are talking about the extreme poverty and hunger so that we can deal with the more nutrition, it affects all the other goals. When we are talking about the gender equality, so when we get, edu when we get girls educated, when we provide education to girls, then the girl become a mom, an educated mom, then it also directly reduces the child mortality of the next generation. So the goals are all interconnected to each other. Right, but still, the, we, more than 120 countries, they failed to achieve the hard target of MDG number four, right? MDG number five is maternal mortality, right? So here we define maternal mortality per 100,000 live births, right? And we want to reduce the maternal mortality by 27%, but we achieve the 45% reduction of maternal mortality. Um, here, let's think about what is the main cause for maternal mortality. Anyone guess? Okay. Infections after In birth, giving birth. Infection after birth is also main cause. Yes, but. And bleeding after. Oh, birth. unsafe abortion is also the big reason, and also the later you you mentioned, bleeding. bleeding. Yes, so bleeding is the number one reason. Okay, let's think about it. Do you think that is it possible for a woman to deliver a baby without bleeding? No, bleeding is so natural thing, right? Then why bleeding is the number one reason for maternal mortality then? Because they fail to stop the bleeding, right? So uh, stopping, the bl stopping the bleeding is very easy process. Like as long as you deliver a baby in a health facility, isn't it? But many of case, they deliver a baby at home with a unprofessional attendance so that they may use the very dirty seizures which cause the infection later. So here again, the maternal mortality cases, like the main cause are so preventable. But many moms are dying when she delivered a baby. So I just work in uh, maternal mortality, the mother child program, MCH program in Malawi. So in a district where I'm working uh, is like Chimutu area. So the population is around like 90,000 people. And, but unfortunately, there are not many health facilities in Chimutu area. So, but in Malawi, nowadays we achieve the health fertility rate up to like 90%. So most of women deliver a baby in a health facility, but like 10%, uh, like still deliver a baby at home. And then you are susceptible to the much bleeding and infection issues. I think it, the fertility rate, health fertility delivery rate is differ by country by country. For example, Malawi is like 90%, but for example, Ethiopia, the health fertility delivery rate is like very low, like I think 30% or 40%, right? So here, that's the one reason. And here, for South Asia, India, or China, they reduce maternal mortality by two thirds, but still, the Sub-Saharan African country are lagging behind. And, and prenatal service care, uh, it's up to, before you deliver a baby, like it increased from 65% to 83%. We also do have some big achievement in MDG number five, but still a long way to go to meet our original targets. Okay, and number six is infectious disease. We want to treat and deal with infectious disease such as HIV AIDS, malaria, or tuberculosis, right? And we do have significant reduction on HIV AIDS, malaria, and, and tuberculosis. Um, here, let's take an example about malaria. Anyone knows how to, the, the, how to transmit like the malaria to person to person? What is the main mechanism? Transmission mechanism, okay? Mosquito. mosquito, yes. So usually mosquito bite a malaria infected person, then the another person, and they transmitted malaria virus to the other people. And anyone has an experience to get malaria before? Yes, yeah. So here, um, usually in Asia, they, we do have like malaria, but the type of malaria is slightly different than in South, the Sub-Saharan Africa. So the type of mosquito are different, but malaria is a really, really like painful. So usually for us, 
we have such a good nutrition for more than 20 years or 30 years. Anybody has a good nutrition more than 40 years here? No, right? <laughs> so we, we are, has been a good nutrition, right? And we have to diet, we have to lose our weight. So for us, if we just got, get malaria, then it's really painful, but taking a medicine, soon you will get over, right? For very like young, little babies, or the, the poor people under has been a more nutrition for a long time, maybe malaria is too much for them to like, resist. So usually malaria mosquito, right? They are fine like after we say like 10 p.m. to up to 4 a.m. in the morning. So if you are sleeping under the mosquito net, that is the one of the best way to prevent malaria, right? So there was a global mobilization to malaria mosquito net to the high malaria prevalence rate country in Southern Africa and Asia, right? So we'll talk about some case study about malaria mosquito net later, but here, that's a one way to uh, d the prevent malaria uh, related to the MDG number six. While I was working in Malawi, like many of my staff got malaria. Uh, that's very unfortunate. Uh, but like some, our female staff, uh, their like life satisfaction increased a lot after one month of malaria. Why? Because after one month, they completely got over and they just forget about how painful it was and realize that their, the, our female staff, they realized that her like weight is less than like 10 <laughs> kilograms before, right? So she's very satisfied. <laughs> but I'm joking. But malaria was very, very, it's very painful. But uh, so usually in Malawi, uh, like January to April is a rainy season. And rainy season means it's a peak time for mosquito. But unfortunately in Malawi, the rainy season is also the weaning period. So you don't have much to eat, all right? So it's really, really sad that during the rainy season, the, the, the hospital where I'm working, the, we have a pediatrics like ward and there is a bed for children and we usually put three babies in one bed, right? There are so many malaria like infected babies during the rainy season. And every night you can hear the moms crying. That means at least one or two babies are dying because of malaria. So it's a serious killer, but the prevention mechanism is quite easy, right? So the sleeping under the mosquito net is a one, the one of the most effective way to prevent malaria, right? And the uh, HIV or t tuberculosis also got a lot of attention for the past 15 years. By the way, anyone knows the name of World Bank president? World Bank president. Jim Kim, right? He's a Korean American and he's a medical doctor. And, and when he was a medical student at Harvard University, he and his friend, Paul Farmer, another medical professor at Harvard University, they had like clinics in HIV AIDS clinic in IT. And they just develop, they just establish one of the most influential, the global health NGO partners in health. And, and the, our World Bank president got a lot of achievement in HIV AIDS like treatments in IT, as well as he did like excellent job on tuberculosis in Peru. So uh, the, our current World Bank president knows really well about this like infectious disease as well. Okay, so the, over the last 15 years, international community like mainly focusing on this MDG number six, it got a lot of attention among the other MDG. And number seven is sustainable environment. But as you know that Environmental issue at macro level is hard to like agree on, right? So what about like reduction on CO2 emission, right? What about the global warming? It's really difficult for like some like some critics say, oh China, you have to cut your CO2 emission. Then China replied that, oh you advanced country, you polluted the air, the, you polluted the environment for the last like 50 or 100 years then why do you blame uh, me that I'm just uh, like developing my economy? So you have to take a price for this environment. So 
here, it's really difficult to have an agreement on this macro level, right? And as you know, that recently the United States, they decide to just, just take away from the Paris Agreement, right? So that was a really, really, like, like a big, big disappointment. Uh, however, like, so when we had MDG, we realized that it's very difficult to set the, the MDG goal related to the macro environmental issues such as global warming, climate change, and the... So the, we reduced the MDG number seven at the micro level. So, okay, it's very important to talk about the macro level environmental issue, but it's really difficult to, like, uh, have an agreement. So let's talk about more micro level issues. So we're talking about more micro level environment for us, like clean water and sanitation. So even though uh, it's a, the title name is environment, but like a main component is also related to like health issue, right? So we achieved that access to safe water increased to 86%, but again at macro level, we failed to effectively and directly handle climate change, global warming, CO2 emission, deforestation, and biodiversity, etc. And number eight, it's a global partnership. So when we have some global development agenda, you know that MDG has eight goals, right? And sustainable development goal, how many goals? There are 17 goals, right? And usually always, the last goal is always global partnership. So in order to achieve the previous goal, let's increase our partnership more, right? That's a global partnership, right? So here, let's quickly summarize the achievement of MDG. So the MDG uh, contributed to the paradigm shift from economic development oriented to the social and human development. And also it has big contribution to poverty reduction and it presents clear, succinct, measurable and time binding outcome. And it worked as an international norm. But this one is very unique one, right? So if you just read many UN declaration, there are so many declaration. And actually impact is very minimal, why? Because the like United Nations and many international organizations, they declare something and that's it, right? Declare, that's it. So the follow-up action hasn't been observed. But this UN Millennium Declaration was very unique, why? For the first time, I guess, they present very clear. That's our goal number one, goal number two, goal number three. And it's very succinct. When we are talking about education, we mainly talking about primary education, very succinct. And it's measurable. Uh, I'm going to look at the primary enrollment rate. It's very measurable and it's also time bounding. So our baseline is 1990 and our, the deadline is 2015. And I think that's the very unique feature, right? That's why it was able to work as an international norm because of these actionable, succinct, measurable time binding outcomes, right? However, we do have many limitations and these limitations are incorporated in the, the next development agenda, sustainable development goal. So let's look at the limitation of MDG. So it less focusing on the traditionally uh, focused item, the economic development issues such as employment, investment, international trade. We don't have any like MDG related to international trade, isn't it? It's mainly about like your education, health, but uh, it's not like uh, employment, investment, international was been a little bit neglected. And it did not include inequality issue, human rights, <coughs> peace and security, and climate change as well. And here, it's kind of like one size fits all approach, not considering country level capacity differences. And also it's a bit like top down approach. So UN like announced that, oh, this is an MDG. Let's follow this eight MDG goal. It's kind of like top down approach. And lack of participation from civil society or private sector. So that's a main like limitation. And let's, uh, let's look at the transition from MDG to SDG then. So in like 2011, uh, UN Secretary General report are talking about the uh, like accelerating process toward MDG and option for sustainable inclusive growth. And we're talking about the issue 
beyond 2015. Oh, 2015 is approaching. What are we going to do after 2015? So they prepare some kind of after post-2015 development agenda here. And one year later, 2012, the UN PASC team, they are talking about the post-2015 development agenda. So the realizing the future we want for all. So they just mapping the four pillar. Oh, after 2015, uh, when we set up the development agenda, uh, let's consider inclusive economic development and comprehensive social development where which the MDG has been focused focusing focused pretty much and peace and security and environmental sustainability it's more macro level so that's the four core pillars uh, we want to incorporate after post 2015 development agenda and 2013 UN high level panel of eminent persons on the post 2015 development agenda, they issue a report on new global partnership, eradicating poverty and transform economies through sustainable development. And they present 12 goals, right? Number of goals increasing, isn't it? From eight to 12 here. Why? Because it's also, it's, it reflect about the limitation. Oh, we haven't touched the many, many important issues in MDG. For example, like here, um, uh, we haven't touched the human right issue, we haven't touched the inequality issue, we haven't touched the investment in international trade. That's why when we prepare the post-2015 development agenda, usually like a presented goal is much larger than previous MDG, right? And year 2013, UN Secretary General report, um, the a life of dignity for all, accelerating progress toward the Millennium Development Goal and advancing the United, United Nations Development Agenda beyond 2015. And actually, they expand their mapping from like four pillar to six pillar, and now they present 15 goals. The number of goals are increasing. And 2014, like this UN Open Working Group, and they follow, this is a very important document. Rio Plus 20 report, the future we want, it's a very foundation like report. So if you are interested in the sustainable development, and I think this is a must read like a document, the future we want. And basically they follow the, the, the philosophy from future we want. And they basically present like three pillar. One, economic development. And second pillar, social development, like human development. And finally, third pillar is sustainable environment. And this is the big three pillars, right? And they presented 17 goals, right? I think after this, like the proposal, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki moon issued a synthesized report, the Road to Dignity by 2030. So actually, this report like include nowadays the 17 sustainable development goals. So this is the new development agenda, global development agenda from last year 2016 to the next 15 year by 2030. So let's take a look at the SDG, Sustainable Development Goal. So here, number one, low poverty, and number two, hunger. It used to be uh, MDG number one as combined, right? So still, we emphasize that no poverty, no hunger is the, like, for most goals for SDG. And number three, good health, right? It's like in MDG, like the MDG goal number four, child mortality. MDG number goal five, maternal mortality. MDG six, infectious disease. They are all related to health issue, isn't it, right? And SDG number three is a good health, right? And number four, education. What MDGs are related to education? MDG number two, primary education. MDG number three, gender equality, but specifically in education, right? So this is the, the SDG number four. And now we do have more comprehensive gender equality goal in SDG five, right? Uh, and also at MDG number seven was environmental sustainability, but was mainly at micro level, the water and sanitation. But now we have a separate SDG goal, six 
clean water and sanitation, and later we emphasize the more macro level environmental sustainability later. And number seven, renewable energy we haven't touched during MDG, and good job and economic growth is a very traditional topic, but hasn't been touched in MDG, but now got a lot of attention in SDG. And innovation and infrastructure and reduced inequality is now like became become a, like a new and important development agenda. Here, when we are talking about the reducing inequality, we may say that oh, let's reduce the inequality between rich country and poor country. But at the same time, we can talk about the within country inequality is increasing. So uh, even though you are advanced country or you are developing country or least developed country, you do have an inequality in domestic, right? So the one big paradigm she puts is that um, for MDGs, mainly about the developing countries issue, right? So, oh, you should reduce the extreme poverty. You should reduce the child mortality. You should achieve the primary education. Actually, those issues is not the relevant issue in advanced country, isn't it? Like, primary education is so common, right? And, right. But, like, in, if you take a look at SDG, like, this renewable energy, I'm sorry, good job, reduce inequality, that, like, many of the sustainable development goals can be applied both to developed country as well as developing country. Now we have much comprehensive frame. And here we also talking about the sustainable city, responsible consumption. And 13, 14, 15, they're, they are related to the environmental sustainability. So here we are talking about the climate change, climate action, life below water, life on land. So now as you see that Three out of 17 goals are related to the macro level environmental sustainability. As you see that we really want to emphasize this environmental issue in SDG. Right? And 16, peace and justice. And 17, always the last goal is the global partnership to achieve the previous 16 goal. Um, here, uh, like another difference between MDG and SDG. Uh, let's take an example of SDG number four. Um, MDG number two is achieving universal primary education, right? So basically, it's more like the quantity-oriented goal. You are sending a children to, you are sending a child to a primary school, and that's it, right? So then you achieve MDG number two. But here, let me say. Quality education, uh, basically SDG, now there is only one goal for education, but it's much, much comprehensive and it's really difficult to achieve. Why? In MDG, we're only talking about the primary education, isn't it? But in SDG, we're talking about primary education, secondary education, tertiary education, as well as lifelong education. So, and also, when we are talking about the education, quantity is important, but also what about the quality? So achieving SDG number four is a whole new dimension like compared to the MDG number two. MDG number two is very straightforward. Let's talk about, let's focus on the primary school. Sending a boy or a girl to primary school, that's it. But now you're talking about primary school, secondary school, tertiary school, lifelong education, as well as what about quality, right? So, here, let's say you successfully send children to primary school. And least developed country context, if you visit like primary school, what happened? Usually it's a one classroom, and there are like 100 children in a classroom. There is no chair, there is no table, of course there is no like textbook as well. And time to time, teacher absent, right? So then, Okay, we send children to school, then we achieve MDG number two, but actual learning is not taking place, right? So when we're talking about the quality education, it's a big, big challenge, right? So SDG has more goals than MDG, but each goal has much depth. So it's a really big challenge, and some of people are very pessimistic Oh, that's too, too much. That's impossible to achieve. But some of them are very optimistic. Oh, we should uh, give it a try. 
and like you should go big, otherwise go home. So it's a big, big challenges and big global development agenda for the next 15 years. Anyone has a question or comment on SDG? Yes, please. Turn on your microphone, thank you. Uh, actually, I have questions. So actually, we know that MDG is a focus on the developing country, but MD, uh, SDGs will be uh, a comprehensive, it's, it's too huge. Just like you said, go for or go eight to the, uh, less developed country, the economic growth will, uh, target will be eight, uh, 7%. Mm -hmm. So actually for many developed, uh, less developed country or developing country emerging uh, economy energy, uh, area, it's very hard to achieve it. So my question is from M MDG to SDGs, what's the, uh, how to say, uh, the government, each, each state's government attitude towards its, uh, its big goals, uh, for a difference, the difference between developed country or developing country? Um, so, yes, that's a good question, but how to answer because like each government has a different like approach and attitude. Uh, but I, I can say for Korean government attitude. So, as you clearly pointed out that SDG are both for developed country as well as developing country, right? But previously in MDG frame, like, oh, MDG is your target for developing country. For advanced country, we're going to help you. Th those kind of attitude was like present in MDG frame. But now SDG, oh, even for advanced country, United States, France, Belgium, or Korea, South Korea, or Japan, we really have to consider how to achieve reduced, reducing inequality in our country. How we can achieve like climate action, how we can contribute to the climate action, the global world as a like advanced economy. So, but Still, the, some countries frame, the, especially for advanced country, is that, oh, we should like, help the developing country to achieve SDG. Like thinking that, oh, uh, SDG is not directly applied to my country. So I think in South Korea, uh, when we prepare the SDG, the main, frame, main like, frame is that how we can assist developing country to assist the SDG, uh, the, to achieve SDG. But the little discussion has been taking place in South Korea, how we can achieve SDG in South Korea. So that's a bit like, I think this is a transition period, but the situation will be getting better. Right, okay. Yes? Uh, SDG, uh, it, it in, in corp incorporates that uh, what to achieve, uh, but critics used to say, say that uh, it doesn't say about how to achieve the goals and targets. Uh, is it right or wrong, Professor? I want to uh, know that. And another is the SDG, it, it, it didn't uh, give uh, the information about what is the role of the developed countries. Because in my knowing, uh, developing countries, can, they alone cannot achieve the uh, SDG goals. And it doesn't, uh, d doesn't say about much about the, what is the role of the developed countries. Uh, I want to verify my knowledge, it is right or wrong. Um, so here, uh, SDG present 17 goals, but they do also present very specific target, 169 targets. So we have huge number of targets. And uh, here, when uh, your colleague mentioned about the role of developed country to assist developing country, I think they also do discuss about those, how we can create partnership between developed and developing country in this partnership for the goal 17. And here, previously the, in MDG, the main actor was kind of like country and government and the United Nation. But as you see, the, now we have really big picture, comprehensive goal. So the, it is not enough to have only traditional actor. And now we have a new emerging actor as well. For example, the academia university, NGO, farms, they all should work together to achieve this SDG for developing country as well as developed country. So yes, uh, this is a huge comprehensive goal. That's why we do need much, much comprehensive partnership ever before, right? Okay, thank you. So let's take a look at uh, some viewpoint who really like insist that we do have more for international aid and international development. So here, 
one view from the international aid, official development aid, proponent, they are saying that, oh, we assume that there is a poverty trap, right? And here, like poverty trap, basically, it creates some vicious cycle. So let's say you are really poor so that you have no money to save, right? Since you have no money to save, so no investment, which make you much poorer. You became much poorer, so you don't have no saving at all, then no investment and even poorer. This vicious cycle like happens. So the initial condition uh, creates some this vicious cycle. And so when the, the, the view from aid proponent who believe that there exists poverty trap, they think that the big push is needed uh, for least developed country to escape from poverty trap. So uh, official development aid from donor country should be increased from the current, like usually 0.3% of their gross national income to 0.7%, more than double uh, of national gross national income according to the resolution at the United Nations General Assembly in 1970. Actually, by the way, the like G7 country or G6 country, they get her together at Uni the United Nations General Assembly in 1970, and they promise to provide 0.7% of their gross national income to the developing country as a like an aid. They promised, but none of them like keep their promise. So here the the aid proponents say that oh let's keep our promise, right? We promise that we provide points at least 0.7% of our gross national income to developing country, right? So, but like some of, some of the, some of country, they meet this 0.7% pledge. Anyone knows which country? There are like five to six country meet this 0.7% of gross national income to the developing country. Yes, yes? Yes, usually Scandinavian country like Sweden and I think Bel Belgium like meet 0.7%. Maybe, maybe, I think very, very close to 0.7. Uh, there are like five to six country who are letting meet this 0.7%. Norway and Sweden, those country, right, Denmark. So here, the many, uh, so the comprehensive development support is needed. So here, when we say the, in order to escape from poverty trap, we do need a big push. And at the same time, we do need a comprehensive big push. So when you have a big push, it is not enough to have only agriculture support. It's not enough to have only education support. So that when you want to assist the least developed country escape from poverty, we do need to have a big push. We increase our official development aid, but at the same time, we do have a comprehensive development support. We do need to support agriculture. We do need to support education, health, environment, good governance, institution, all comprehensive thing. So this philosophy has been incorporated in the MDG. So in MDG, when we are talking about extreme poverty and hunger, it's mainly related to agriculture. Why? Because more than 90% of the extreme poor people, they are rural farmer, right? So how to like, help them escape from extreme poverty and how, how to reduce the hunger? Basically, the one effective way to deal with the MDG number one is increase agricultural productivity. So most of like extremely poor people are rural farmer, right? So it's related to the education, the agricultural goal. And the MDG number two, achieving primary education, gender equality in education are related to education. MDG number four, five, six are related to health, right? So why MDG include agriculture, education, health, environment all together is because we do need a comprehensive support, right? That's a basic philosophy, uh, idea. And here, the, during the transition from planned economy to market economy in 1990, from Eastern European country, Poland, right? Czechoslovakia. And like some argument, at the argument was there that, oh, we do need a, like a big push because like each components have a complementary to each other. So here, you have to liberalize your price. At the same time, you have to privatize your state-owned company. And all these like, uh, transition policy should be taking place together. Why? Because they do have some complementary to each other. Right? Okay. And major voice for this eight proponents is Professor Jeffrey Sachs at Columbia University. 
and he wrote a very famous book, The End of Poverty. Anyone who read this book before? Very good. So I think this is really well written book. Right? So I definitely uh, recommend all of you to uh, read this book, The End of Poverty, uh, written in 2005. Right? So, uh, and the Professor Sachs wrote a book, The End of Poverty, in 2005, and one year later, Commonwealth, and recently he wrote a book, Age of Sustainable Development. Uh, by the way, the, the recent book, Age of Sustainable Development, can be downloaded from massive open online course MOOC. Right? So he developed uh, the Age of Sustainable Development as a massive open online course in 2013. So nowadays, you can freely access 14 weeks of Professor Sack's lecture on this Age of Sustainable Development. So I strongly recommend you to Google the Age of Sustainable Development MOOC and you can take a, uh, you can enroll 14 weeks of this MOOC course. And after successfully finishing these 14 weeks MOOC, then you can freely download it, the, the book text, textbook, The Age of Sustainable Development as a PDF file, right? right. And the Jeff was an economic advisor for Poland, Russia, when they transit their economy to the market, market-oriented economy. And actually, he led MDG. So he was the main architect to design eight Millennium Development Goal. And he also like, did a Millennium Villages project in 10 different African countries to show that when we have a comprehensive support, then the MDG goals are achievable. So he wanted to show that those eight MDGs are achievable. And this is, is a big project in the in African context, the Millennium, Develop Millennium Villages project. And basically, uh, like when some like the, the aid proponents say that, oh, we should increase our aid to the developing country, then like the conservative media, like Wall Street Journal say that, oh, that's too much. If we give too much to developing country, it hurts our economy. Then Jeff responds said that giving till it hurts, no. Giving till it heals the extreme poverty. So Jeff's basic idea is that, oh, still, we are providing only 0.3% of our income. That's too little, right? So we have much room to increase our support to the developing country. And he also saying very witty that uh, try not to be G7 first, but you can always be G.7 country, right? So however, there is also the other uh, thought that uh, the view from aid skeptics uh, basically saying that Oh, the international aid isn't working well. Why? First, the motivation of donor country are very complex, right? So, like, some motivation based on realism that it's a politically, diplomatically driven to strengthen the international politics power of a donor country. During the bipolar era, when U United States and USSR are competing to each other, basically, the the U.S. government like gave a lot of aid to like one country, even though the country was governed by the military coup d'état dictator. But if he or she, the military, the dictators are pro-American, they receive a lot of like U.S. aid. If a country is like under a dictatorship but it's a pro-USSR, they receive a lot of aid from USSR. So yes, there is a like a politically driven motivation. And also there's a mon mon mercantilism motivation that for the economic benefit of a donor country. For example, like one donor country like, like have constructed like a main road in a developing country to connect the company already like located in those developing country, right? Those kind of like mon mercantilism motivation do exist. And of course, we do have a pure humanitarian motivation to help the, like, the developing country. But these three different motivations are all like mingled together. And also, we do have some kind of lack of accountability issue. So here, um, basically, we just, the donor country provide uh, aid, and then, then that's, the, that's it. So then, once the recipient country receive the aid, then donor country cannot have a control. You should use this money for this with responsibility and accountability with a transparent manner. No. So once the recipient country receive aid, then the, the, 
the control is not anymore in the donor country's hand, right? So accountability is a one issue. And sometimes uh, it's too idealistic and sometimes it's too top-down approach, right? So here, the view from aid skeptics, they are like bringing about this issue. And here, also they just pointed out that aid itself has problem. So it may reinforce the dictatorship and corruption of a recipient country. It also may weakening free market principle. For example, you receive a lot of aid, then you don't have to save, right? So your domestic saving decrease and the, your domestic investment decrease. So it related to the, your productivity decrease and your export decrease and you just create some vicious cycle. So you became more reliant on the aid. And again, you receive a lot of aid, then like it's, it causes, it creates some huge incentive for political rivalry for aid. If you grip the power, then you receive a lot of aid money from the donor country. So sometimes because of this like, aid, it creates huge incentive to the political rivalry led to domestic conflict, sometimes civil war. And sometimes like aid, as a paradox of plenty, you receive a lot of money from donor country. It creates some domestic inflation. And it also like, affects your exchange rate appreciation. So you lose your trade competitiveness. Then you become more reliant on aid because you, you, have, like, you lose your trade export competitiveness. So sometimes we do have a paradox, right? So here, the aid skeptics say that, oh, we gradually phase out aid and try to strengthen homegrown development capacity through international finance market or something like that. And as you may read this book, The Dead Aid, written by Dambia Moyo, she's a female economist, uh, she's from Zambia, and she used to work in World Bank, and basically Dambia Moyo saying that, oh, uh, we really phase out international aid, and the developing country should be uh, working in this international market, finance market, instead of relying on the, the international aid. So the major voice uh, from the William Astley, Professor William Astley at NYU, New York University. He used to be an economist, senior economist at the World Bank. And he uh, wrote a book, very famous book, The White Man's Burden in 2006. One year after, Jeffrey Sachs wrote a book, The End of Poverty. So this is also a very good book, but the structure is very interesting. So if you read this White Man's Burden, then like, let's say chapter two, in White Man's Burden started like this. Oh, in Jeff's book, The End of Poverty in Chapter 2, he say this and this and this, and that's wrong. <laughs> chapter 3, <laughs> the Jeff mentioned in his book Chapter 3, blah, 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 and that's wrong, the, the basic structure. So, however, if you read two books together, The End of Poverty and The White Man's Burden, you can have much balanced view, right? So. Here, the William Astley wrote many books, but Elusive Cast for Growth, Economist, Adventure, and Misadventure in the tropi Tropics. I think this book is really, really good book if you are interested in development economics, right? So I think many, many like graduate school in the United States are using this book as a subtext, right? And the, the book I just mentioned, The White Man's Burden, Why the West Effort to Aid the Rest have done so much ill and so little good here. Right? Basically, the William Astley do not, does not believe the poverty trap. And also, like, he thinks that Jeffrey Sachs' idea, oh, this is an MDG goal, you should follow. It's a too much top-down approach. And here, he basically planned everything by himself. Right? That's basically the William Astley's criticism. And this top-down approach, planner's approach, distort the market. That's basically the criticism from Astley. And actually, like supports for gradual, homegrown institutional development based on market principle. Okay, okay. Let's let me uh, ask like a couple of you, like your own opinion on these two side of you. A anyone has an say? So, which view do you think that uh, more right or it's okay with you? They do have a point, by the way, each side, right? 
And what do you think about these two views on international aid and international development? Anyone? If you have to take one side, for sure, then which side would you like to take? Is it too simplistic question, right? Always safe to say that, oh, I think both sides has a point and both sides has a wrong, right? That's an easy and safe way, right? Um, uh, like one like good book is that, uh, the book I recommend to you is that the, the, the professor at Princeton, uh, Princeton University, the Peter Singer, Professor Peter Singer wrote a book, The Life You Can Save. I think he's a professor in ethics at Princeton, and he wrote a book, The Life You Can Save. It's a very small book. It's a less than 200 pages, and Peter Singer basically right, reviewed the two sides, the Jap side and the Estonian side, and Peter Singer like drew conclusion by himself. So uh, when you really consider the two views from eight proponents and eight skeptics, you may also refer to Peter Singer's, like, his own opinion, right? The, and also, I think you can Google the title of the book, The Life You Can Save, then you can easily, freely download it, the, the book text. Yes? Um, are AIDS skeptics proposing that we don't provide any aid to developing countries? Uh, there's a, like a much degree. Like some say that, like Dambia Moyo, that uh, we immediately cut the international aid. Or like some say that we gradually phase out the international aid and uh, more like emphasize this homegrown like institution development. Yes, there is a, like a much various degree. Yes. Okay, yeah. so here he, the, William Astley in his book like pointed out that, oh, look at this malaria case, right? Jeffrey Sachs insists that we should provide malaria mosquito net for free immediately to prevent malaria. And the Astley, he just mentioned that, oh, I visited Kenya, and when some NGO provide a mosquito net for free, then he just find out some like, farmer are using malaria mosquito net as a fish net. <laughs> right? So that's the, like, a big problem when you provide a mosquito net for free. It distorts a local market. I just saw one woman, like, like she used the mosquito net, the white mosquito net, as a, like, a gown of her wedding dress or something like that. <laughs> And here basically, and he pointed out that, I think it's a fair point that because an NGO provide a mosquito net for free, it kills local vendor of mosquito net. There is a local distributor, local like vendor who sell the mosquito net. But because of this NGO's free provision of mosquito net, they all bankrupt, right? So Esteli like pointed out that, okay, you can fr provide a mosquito net for free this time, but what about five years later? What about 10 years later? Would you come back to this country to provide a mosquito net again? So here he just pointed out this, like a, like a market distortion, right? And which, which idea do you think that is more correct? Should we provide a mosquito net for free? Yes? I guess that you should provide with our awareness campaign because I knew that uh, some of them like uh, just use it for another purpose and mm -hmm. they got malaria at the same time. So they're not aware of mm -hmm. how to use it and when to use it and the importance of it. Yes, that's like an information campaign, awareness campaign should be followed with those like a distribution. Yeah, that's a very good point. So here basically these two competing ideas, but like whenever you uh, have a chance to go to the like a lecture by Jeffrey Sachs or William Astley, uh, they criticize each other, right? And like it's a like a big discussion, isn't it? Right? So too big to be uh, drawing a conclusion. So if your worldview and if you are, your philosophy is more inclined to oh we should help the poor more, and I think like we should like assist the least developed country more, then maybe you are one step closer to the eight proponents view. However, if you have another different view that, oh, we should follow like more like a market approach, then they should do their own and something like that. And you say that, oh, the, I just agree with the critics and critical points raised by these the eight skeptics. So, but it's more like a, depending on your worldview, right? So it's harder to 
draw the which one is like correct because each side has do have their anecdotal evidence like the eight proponents say that oh, when we provide a uh, mosquito net for free we do have an evidence that the malaria prevalence rate decreases a lot and the eight skeptics they do have an anecdotal evidence that oh when we provide a mosquito net for free somebody misused the mosquito net right it like killed the local banders they do have a point but like, each side like do have an anecdotal evidence but it's not a scientific evidence to prove which side is right right so it's too big the big big debate argument right okay so the new trend for the 21st century is that like like now we want to escape from this big debate and debate between eight proponents and eight skeptics is too big to be proved anecdotal evidence for both sides do exist but they are not scientific evidence so instead of big debate it had better rigorously evaluate a small development project whether it works or not and then accumulate a hard evidence so uh, instead of having a big debate whether we increase the international aid or not uh, why don't we just stay focusing on a really small project let's say uh, we, we want to evaluate the, the mosquito net provision program by one NGO or we want to stay focusing on a small scholarship program to a primary school student then we rigorously evaluate the impact of this the aid program if we have an evidence that uh, if this is a very effective program then let's increase our support to those effective program and if this program turn out to be ineffective it's not working then the, we have to phase out those like international aids so this approach now the like world bank and major aid agency accept this rigorous impact e evaluation as a new norm right so uh, this is a new trend so the case study uh, i think this is the, the last topic i want to uh, talk about with you um, here the malaria prevention net provision program so i already introduced the big debate whether we freely provide a mosquito net or whether uh, we have to do some like cost sharing oh this is the mosquito net it's a five dollar then you have to pay at least like 10 percent or 20 percent of the the mosquito net price so you have to pay 50 cents or one dollar those cost sharing mechanism the one who uh insists those cost sharing is that then if we are doing cost sharing that only people who really value mosquito net will buy the net so nobody will use mosquito net for like fish net if they pay at least one dollar or 50 cents so here when the jeffrey Sox and Ilya Mastelis are like saying the the mosquito net like issue like one group of researchers are conducted a rigorous impact evaluation so here annually just more than half a million people die because of malaria and most effective prevention strategy is mosquito net so the argument between on malaria net is that whether it's a pre-provision versus cost sharing so the one group of researchers conducted a randomized control trial which is the like a really important method to prove the causality so i think like some of you may have some lecture in your graduate school i think at seoul national university like graduate school of international study do you have some courses about this impact evaluation maybe or maybe not right so uh, here through this randomized control trial they just compare which argument is more correct and effective so what they are doing is very simple so here they randomly choose two group like here we have around like 30 students here i randomly choose a group of 15 and assign oh you are group a and the other group oh you are group b i just randomly choose okay i just have like a draw line here and if i compare the average age between this group and this group what do you think is it very similar or maybe or maybe not what about i just wanted to calculate average weight of these two group which group is like, heavier maybe equal or so this number is small so we don't have a like clear answer but when we have for example 10,000 people and i just randomly choose like i just 
tossing a coin and head up, then you go to the group A. The tail is up, then you go to the group B. I just randomly assign the two people, 5,000 in group A, 5,000 in group B. What happened is that because I randomly assigned these two people, two group, so the, the group characteristics on average are very, very similar. So even though I do not have to ask your individual weight, on group average weight of the group A and group B should be very similar, right? So now I have a identical two group on average. Then I assign the, the mosquito net here for free and the other group, so you have to have cost sharing. So all the other things are equal if I have a random assignment, right? So that group A, group B, their height, their on average age, their educational background, their gender, their weight, their way of thinking, futuristic thinking, health seeking behavior, their time preference, their risk preference, which we very difficult to measure, on average should be equal to each other. What is the only difference is that, oh, group A, they got mosquito net for free. Group B, they got the mosquito net through cost sharing price, right? So with this method, they, they just evaluate the effectiveness of this program. First, we do have a criticism that if you receive the mosquito net for free, they may misuse the mosquito net. So they just first check the usage, whether they correctly use the mosquito net or not. And what they are finding is that between the free mosquito net group and cost sharing group, the, there is no big difference on usage, right? So the William Astley pointed out some anecdotal evidence, but in this setting, the usage is more or less the same between two groups. Second, uh, cost sharing group decreased demand for mosquito net. So why do you think that we do find out some cost sharing group decrease the, the take up rate of mosquito net? Why do you think so? Yes. So for free provision group, you don't have to pay any, any money, right? You receive or not, that's your decision. So usually take up rate is almost 100%, isn't it? You just freely provide a mosquito net, I accept it. So your take up rate is 100%. But in the cost sharing group, the demand decreased because you have to pay at least like 10% of the mosquito net. So who do you think that they decide not to buy the mosquito net then? Usually the poor people, oh, still it's only 50 cents or $1, but that's big money to me. So usually the much poorer people, they decide not to take up this mosquito net. So we do find that the, there's a decreased demand for net among, mainly among the, the poor people. So here, so unfortunately, so after this take up, low take up in the cost sharing group, of course, the malaria prevalence rate is much higher in this group, right? So here, they just calculate, oh, there's cost so that uh, the, the health facility should prepare the malaria treatment pills and diagnostic test, and there is a, like a cost, isn't it? So they just calculate the cost and benefit of this program, right? And they just conclude that free provision is more efe efficient, and uh, it's much more cost effective. So what they're arguing is that even instead of like freely giving the mosquito net, sometimes we can give a subsidy. Uh, I can give you one dollar please use this mosquito net. Even in this sense, it's much cost effective than the scenario that a lot of people got malaria and should be treated by health facilities. So here, after having this scientifically proven evidence, uh, it's very difficult to find out the argument anymore, uh, whether mosquito net is freely provided or not, right? So now after having this scientifically proven hard evidence, now we have a scale up in malaria mosquito net provision by WHO or Global Fund, et cetera. So it's a really good example that how the impact evaluation, the rigorous scientific evaluation of an aided program can contribute to scaling up the very effective program, okay? And the, another thing like, is that, as I mentioned, SDG is really comprehensive so that we do have a more comprehensive partnership so that here, not only from donor country and international organization, but also we do need a, 
the partnership from civil society, from academia, university, and even the private corporation right, as a global corporate social responsibility program. So we do need a like, comprehensive partnership for SDG. Okay. That's it for today's lecture. And now uh, I just turn to your uh, questions for a couple of minutes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to ask a question about China's um, grant of development assistance. Mm -hmm. I know that OECD DOT reports provide very thorough, comprehensive reports on development assistance, but since China is not a member of OECD, mm -hmm. um, it's hard to get the data about China, mm -hmm. like where China grants development assistance. and. Mm -hmm in which sectors strategically uh, it provides uh, aid. So I wanted to ask if you have the chance to get access to the data about China's development assistance. Uh, like China is a giant, even in the international development. So when I visit the rural village, very remote rural village of African countries in Malawi, then the young kids they just showing up from like, like bushes and say to me that China, China. <laughs> <laughs> so they all think that all oh, the Asian people are Chinese, right? That shows that their influence in African continent, right? They are a huge country, and they provide a lot of like support. But as your colleague pointed out, that they are like one step, I'll say like ten step away from OECD DAX like norms, right? So they are taking a different like a way. But like here, so China sometimes like here, like OECD deck has some guideline, but sometimes China has a, their own way. And, but Chinese influence in African countries like development is huge and they provide a lot of resources. But some people criticize that in return, China grab all the natural resources uh, from a country sometimes they do not create some local employment while they're constructing a road. Chinese people, they just brought like 100,000 Chinese people from the mainland to African country and they are constructing the road. And so the, what, I'm, what I'd like to say is that yes, China has a really big influence, but they are one step away from the OECD DAG norm, right? So. Uh, nowadays, many researches are going on the characteristics of Chinese official development aid style. Uh, but that's not my expertise, so uh, I do not have a, like a detailed answer to your question. But uh, I always experience that Chinese like big, big influence is getting larger and larger in least developed country. And I think that China also specifically like focusing on the infrastructure. So. Whenever like, I have a, like, a really big paved way roads or the big buildings, those things, I just ask who just built this like, a big highways and these buildings and conventional centers, then all, all, all of the time answer is, oh, Chinese government freely just gave this, the highway to us or something like this. So Chinese, uh, recently, Chinese government recently launched the, the Asian Infrastructure, International Infrastructure Bank, right? Asian AIIB, right? So that also shows that Chinese government put a lot of emphasis on the infrastructure in international development. But like, please ask experts in this Chinese like development ODA. So, but that's a really good question, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so actually, uh, just you mentioned that China donated so uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, ad, uh, offered many aid to the Africa, mm -hmm. but uh, compared to Japan, offers much aid to the uh, Asian countries, especially South Asia, mm -hmm. uh, Asian country. So also this area is uh, China also want to have a big influence in this area. So my question is, uh, speaking of these two countries, so how, how, where is the focus of the uh, South Korea's donate? Oh, that's a really, um, really good question, and that's exactly the very important homework for South Korea really consider. So, for example, United States and Japan, the amount of aid is much larger than South Korean government. We are like a new donor, but like the ODA amount is much smaller than the United States or Japan. 
And like in terms of like the, the, the China is a big country, so they can send like 100,000 people to African country, right? So uh, what is the like our own niche way like between like US style aid or the Japan style aid or the Chinese style aid? So the South Korean government really uh, need to consider, I think this is also applied to like a Belgium or the like San Diego country. It's a small country, so maybe they can specialize in some sector or we will specialize in education ODA or health ODA, but those strategies really need to be really contemplated. And the regional focus, yes, the Japan, like mainly focusing on the, the like Southeast Asian country, right? And China, they increase their influence in African continent. So that's also the big, big policy question, whether we concentrate in one region as a donor country, or should we cover the most of like least developed country as comprehensive as possible? So that's also the policy question. And uh, we, it's harder to have a one single answer to this. But South Korean government, uh, we are close to like Japan. So that if we look at the portfolio of South Korean government's ODA, the majority of the portion of the ODA goes to Southeast Asian country. Okay, one more question, yes. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I am just wondering uh, how the increase in aid will increase, decrease the saving and decrease the productivity. How the aid, uh, increasing aid will decrease the saving. In my knowing, it, I, was, uh, I have an opposite feeling. Uh, I, I think that increasing aid will increase the investment and it will increase the productivity. Yeah, I agree. So, so, it does not like automatically decrease when you have an aid. It does not automatically decrease domestic savings. It's a one. They are talking about the one scenario, right? Still, we can think about the positive scenario, isn't it? So you have a you you have a like aid. So if the government recipient government properly use this aid in a like really good investment, then it boosts up the domestic investment, isn't it? So yes, we can think about the another the big the positive side of those circle. So they just pick up the like uh, the the dark side of the picture, right? So yeah, we do think that the other side of so the aid can create very synergistic effect in domestic savings and like the investment as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, answering her question, um, there is a really good website on tracking down like the Chinese. Um, development aids. It's called china.aiddata.org. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. the information. Yeah. Those websites provide a lot of like data for Chinese official development aid. Yes. Thank you. Uh, um, yeah, I just had a small question about um, the lack of accountability you were talking about that uh, everything uh, relies on the recipient, uh, recipient country. Um, I was wondering why isn't the follow-up a bit more concrete, like it, it, uh, besides the like five-year-olds, uh, uh, after five years that they make like a report, why mm -hmm. is it more? Oh yeah, it was more like a simplistic statement, but nowadays we emphasize the accountabilities and like responsibility of a like recipient country, yes. We do have a, like some process, as you mentioned, after three years, we're going to review the your aid program and we will decide whether we continue to do this program or not. So uh, those accountability issue, transparency issue uh, is a really, really important, especially for the donor country as well as a recipient country. So we do have a process, but they just highlight the like, side effects. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. And I, I have a question regarding um, SDGs. Um, so in Korea, what, like in Korean government, what measures taken to like encourage those, uh, encourage the company or the um, NGOs or other um, people to mm. achieve the goal? Mm. Thank you. So like one simple answer uh, can be that South Korea, uh, like among OECD DAC country development like assistant like committee, the the gross rate of ODA for the last ten year, uh, South Korea was the highest. 
So still our ODA volume is like, like small compared to the United States and Japan, but the growth rate of ODA volume is uh, uh, very fast. So nowadays South Korea, like government, like Korea like aid agency, Koika, Korean International Corporate Agency, they strongly encourage many NGO and university, even the private corporation, like to participate in this international development project by providing the uh, like subsidy, the, the grants and the, like the, the fund. So the South Korean government, the aid agency, they are increasing their aid volume. So they urge many other sectors, participant, like NGO, private firm, even university participate in this the aid work. So that's a one like one trend. One last question before you have a 10 minute break. Okay, Lanel. Oh, thank you, Professor. Uh, in terms of, for definitions, to clarify definitions, so when you talk about aid, does it also include uh, loans or, or are these uh, completely conditional or unconditional aid? Oh. And how about FDIs? Like here, like the, the you can, access the OECD DAC webpage, then you have a, like a detailed definition. Yes, there is a like a free grant, and also there is a like a loan with a low interest rate. And also like some like loan or some like grant has some conditionality. So OECD DAC say that, oh, you're, they recommend that, oh, when you have a like portfolio between free grant and loan, they recommend oh, at least 70% of your ODA, like recommend it to be the, the free grant. And the thirty percent can be like a loan with low interest rate, but in South Korea, uh, still like we have like one to one relation. So we have the in our total ODA volume, like fifty percent is a free grant, and the another half fifty percent is like a loan. So like the OECD DAC has a like a policy recommendation on the portfolio of loan to grant ratio, and also what about the conditionality issue? So. Oh, you can take a look at more detailed documents. Thank you. That's a good. Also, that's a good, like, a good po important point in the policy discussion among this international aid. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your attention, and uh, hope you enjoy the summer school rest of it. Thank you. Yeah.